part two of the series of lectures in which we talk about how to deal with virus infections. Last time we talked about vaccines and we discussed how they prevent viral disease because of the memory response that they can establish. However, vaccines have little use if an individual is already infected. There is an exception that we've talked about, and if I were there today, I would pause here and ask you if you remembered what it is. So I'll give you a second or two to think about which virus infection we've talked about, where you can actually use a vaccine to prevent disease after infection has occurred. That would, of course, be rabies, where you can be given a rabies vaccine after acquiring the virus by a bite, and it will still have time to protect. But for most other virus infections, this is not possible. Therefore, we turn to antivirals. These can stop an infection once it's been started. The problem with antivirals is that we've been working on them for quite a long time, well over 50 years, yet we still have an arsenal of antiviral drugs that is very small. There are slightly over 30 antiviral drugs that are available today on the U.S. market. Most of these are against HIV, herpes viruses, and a few other viruses, and mainly viruses that cause persistent infections. And we'll explore why this is, why there are so few drugs uh, in, in our discussion today. Here's a table listing some of the available antiviral drugs. This is not a complete table, but it's meant to give you an idea of what's available. There are a number of inhibitors against influenza A viruses, and that, of course, is because this virus, as we've talked about before, uh, causes quite a bit of morbidity and mortality annually, and having antiviral drugs can be of use when vaccines have, have not been taken. And then you see a list of other viruses, including the herpes viruses, uh, for which there are a number of inhibitors that target the viral DNA polymerase. There are also some other uh, drugs like sidofovir and tenofovir, uh, which can be used actually not only against herpes viruses, but against other DNA viruses as well, like pox viruses and hepatitis B viruses. Uh, HIV is a major target, and we'll talk about this today, and there are many different ways you can inhibit viral replication. There are also different inhibitors for influenza virus uh, from the ones that we've talked about above here. We'll talk about those and how they work as well. Uh, and then we have inhibitors against hepatitis C virus. There's an old one, ribavirin, and two brand new ones that have just come on the market. And then an inhibitor against respiratory syncytial virus. So not many compared with drugs, say, against uh, bacterial infections. Why are there so few antiviral drugs? Well, one of the problems is that a compound that interferes with virus growth often adversely affects the host cell. We often have side effects of antivirals, and if there are significant side effects, they can't be licensed. This is unacceptable. In addition, as you know, every viral step in the life cycle engages host functions. Viruses are parasites of many aspects of host biochemistry. Therefore, it's very difficult to separate functions that are unique to the virus compared to those of the host cell. For example, if you inhibit a viral polymerase, it's possible that there are going to be some inhibitions of cellular enzymes because they're so similar and therefore you'll have side effects. In addition, there are lots of other problems that make it difficult to make antivirals. Uh, many important viruses can't, simply can't be grown in culture. Uh, there might not be an animal model for infection, or they're simply too dangerous to work with. Uh, so hepatitis B virus, the papillomaviruses, norovirus are all very difficult, if not impossible, to grow in culture. Smallpox uh, has no animal model. And this is an interesting story because two antivirals are currently being tested for stockpiling in case of an outbreak of bioterrorism caused by, by smallpox. And there, there isn't an animal model, and the FDA is uh, 
debating whether they should be licensed or not in the absence of having a good animal model. And then finally, viruses like Ebola, Lassa, and smallpox are very dangerous and difficult to work with in, in, in modes of traditional antiviral discovery. But maybe the third reason is the most important, and that is that a, a drug that is designed to inhibit virus infection has to block virus replication completely. It must be a potent compound. And this is different from many other pharmaceuticals that are used not against viruses but for other problems. These can work even if you only partially block, for example, enzyme activity. But virus replication needs to be fully blocked. If not, you will get resistant mutants. So virus replication in the presence of an inhibitor is a recipe for getting resistance. So this problem makes it very expensive to discover antiviral drugs. You have to search through many of them and often you go a long way and it fails at, at a step late in the process and you have to start over again. So here's a graph showing the effect of different amounts of an antiviral drug. We're looking at the viral load in the red curves. This is how much the virus is replicating uh, with time. And in this experiment, we give the drug at a certain point, uh, and then we measure virus production. And you can see the optimal dose of the drug inhibits viral replication substantially, so that there's very little virus replication with time. With an intermediate dose, we initially have inhibition of replication, but then uh, replication resumes, and with a low dose, there's barely any inhibition at all. So this emphasizes the point that the drugs need to be potent. They have to inhibit viral replication substantially, otherwise resistant mutants will emerge. Another problem relates to the short nature of, very, of many virus infections, which is something we've talked about uh, during our lecture on acute infections. As you know, Many of these acute infections, not all of them, but many of them are short. The rhinovirus lasts a few days, norovirus lasts a day or two. By the time you feel sick, it's really too late to have any impact on clinical disease. In fact, the currently available influenza virus inhibitors must be taken within a day or two after feeling the first symptoms, otherwise they have no value in changing the course of infection. So you have to give the drugs early in infection, you can't give the drugs prophylactically. This is really not something that uh, is useful to do. There are some exceptions. There, there's some consideration to using anti-AIDS drugs prophylactically in some populations. But for the most part, you don't want to give uh, drugs to healthy people with the idea of preventing virus infections. There are lots of safety issues there. So the idea of giving drugs prophylactically is not a good uh, substitute for trying to develop rapid diagnostics. One of the problems we have is that we can't diagnose virus infections quickly enough. For example, when you get a rhinovirus infection, by the time you feel ill, if you go to a physician, get your prescription, uh, and then go and take it, it would be too late to take the drug. And anyway, we don't have ways to diagnose these infections quickly, so you wouldn't even be able to do that. So the short nature of uh, many virus infections, acute virus infections, makes it a problem to develop antiviral agents. Now, we, you might ask, why not just give an inhibitor that would target many viruses? If someone comes down with a respiratory infection, for example, give them a broad-spectrum virus inhibitor. Well, the fact is we don't have such antivirals available, although we do have, <clears throat> for example, antivirals that could be used for gram-negative or gram-positive bacterial infections. We don't have uh, broad-spectrum antivirals. This is not to say that they're not being worked on. Certainly many laboratories are interested in identifying such inhibitors. And, and there's one promising one I want to tell you about. It's called LJ1001. This is really a broad-spectrum antiviral that targets enveloped viruses. And this is a table showing you a variety of different viruses from different families, uh, which have single-stranded RNA of minus or positive sense, uh, as well as enveloped viruses with DNA genomes. You can see this column tells you whether there's an envelope or not, and, and then whether this drug has activity against these viruses. In other words, whether the use of this drug in cell culture this is only experiments in cell culture, if that is able to inhibit virus infection. So you can see all the viruses that are enveloped, 
are inhibited by this antiviral. If we go down to the bottom, adenovirus, which does not have an envelope, is not inhibited. The picornaviruses are not inhibited. Of course, they're not enveloped. And the rheoviruses with, with a double-stranded RNA genome and an icosahedral capsid also not enveloped. So it, this inhibitor doesn't block the replication of all viruses, but it does inhibit a great deal of them, some of which are quite important, including uh, Ebola influenza viruses, um, para-influenza viruses, even HIV-1, yellow fever, hepatitis, this would be a hepatitis C virus, West Nile virus. So this has a lot of potential. It's still very early in the development of this, of this drug. Now, how, you might ask how it works to have such a broad spectrum. Well, the key here is the presence of the viral envelope. That's what's common among all these viruses. And viruses without an envelope are not susceptible, so it has something to do with the envelope. Now here's the compound shown here. It's a relatively simple organic compound called LJ001 with a number of uh, aliphatic rings. And what it seems to do is insert into lipid bilayers and destroy them. So here on the bottom are electron micrographs of vesicular stomatitis virus uh, that have been treated with either the diluent on the left, and you can see intact particles here. Uh, in the middle panel is treatment of viruses with a similar compound, LJ025, which is not active. It doesn't inhibit virus replication. You see the virus particles are intact. But LJ001, the broad spectrum inhibitor, uh, which I showed the results of in the previous slide, you can see it trashes the virus particles. They're, they're destroyed. So basically, this inhibitor inserts into the viral membrane and ruptures the virus so the nucleic acid release, and of course, this prevents uh, infectivity. Now, you might ask why this compound is not toxic to cells. Apparently, it does also insert into cell membranes, but because cell membranes regenerate quickly, apparently it doesn't have side effects. Whether that holds out in uh, animal testing, we'll have to see, but this does have some promise uh, as perhaps the first broad spectrum antiviral. Nevertheless, we don't have it yet, and we therefore are restricted to identifying individual virus infections before we can prescribe an antiviral drug. Let's talk a little bit about the history of antiviral drug development before we go on to talk about some specific examples of these. Uh, the, the history of antiviral drugs really begins in the early 1950s. There had been up to that time a lot of success in treating bacterial infections with sulfonamide antibiotics, and so derivatives of those were searched for antiviral activity. And among the first were the thiosemicarbazones, which were produced that were shown to be active against pox viruses. This was an important target. Uh, smallpox was still a major threat to humans after World War II. It wasn't eradicated until 1979, so there was a need to develop antiviral drugs. Fast forward to today, we have new antiviral drugs that have been developed uh, against pox viruses. They are uh, set with their own s series of problems, and we discussed that on an episode of This Week in Virology, which I'll uh, link to in the notes in the reading materials for this lecture. In the 1960s and 1970s, drug companies engaged in what we call blind screening. These were large programs whose goal it was to find chemicals that have antiviral activity, and they were mainly initiated because of the success that had been achieved in treating bacterial infections uh, with antibiotics. In blind screening, there's no attempt to, to focus uh, the work on a virus or a, or a virus-specific mechanism. Essentially what is done is to take collections of chemicals, chemicals that have been synthesized by the companies or purchased or, nat or mixtures of natural products which are obtained from the environment. These are tested for their ability to block the replication of viruses in cell culture. You simply ask, does something inhibit activity? If something does, it's called a hit, uh, which would be a a mixture or compounds that block viral replication in vitro. You would try and purify the active ingredient molecules that are obtained by this process that inhibit virus replication. These are called leads. They're then modified systematically by chemists to improve a number of the properties, for example, to improve the potency, to reduce toxicity in cell culture, 
uh, perhaps increased solubility, bioavailability, getting the compound to where you need it to go in order to inhibit replication. And other uh, prop pharmacokinetic properties need to be uh, improved. In these early studies, thousands and thousands of molecules were made and screened before anything was even tested in humans. And there was a lot of effort and very little success. An exception is a molecule shown on this slide on the right called Symmetrel or amantadine. This was approved in the late 1960s for treating influenza A virus infection. It's now one of three drugs that are available for treating influenza. However, its mechanism of action was unknown until the 1990s when we then learned that it blocked uh, virus entry into cells. Today, antiviral drug discovery is very different. It's been revolutionized by a number of different techniques and approaches, the ability of recombinant DNA technology and, and very sophisticated chemistry has made extreme targeting of discovery possible. You can focus on a, on a particular virus gene, you can clone the gene encoding the protein, express it in genetically tractable organisms, you can purify the product and analyze it in atomic detail to understand what might good, be a good part of it to target with antiviral compounds. We know life cycles now of most viruses after many, many years of study, so we can uh, identify targets for intervention. And even for viruses that we can't propagate in cell culture, we can uh, get inhibitors because we can express the proteins, uh, have an assay for their activity, and design inhibitors to block that. Essentially, blind screening procedures are dead. Antiviral discovery is very focused. And this slide shows a replication cycle. It happens to be a coronavirus, but it, we, we can generalize it to any virus infection just to show you that at every step of the virus replication cycle, there are points of intervention for antiviral drugs. For example, the attachment and entry steps. We have fusion inhibitors for HIV, and we have entry inhibitors for influenza. We'll talk about some of those in a few moments. Uh, interferon has been used for many years to treat hepatitis C, and as you know, interferon induces the synthesis of the so-called interferon-stimulated genes, or ISGs, of which there are over a thousand. They have many mechanisms of antiviral activity. Many inhibitors of nucleic acid synthesis have been developed for HIV and the herpes viruses. Uh, these include nucleoside and non-nucleoside analogs. We'll talk about those shortly. And as you know, there are proteases required for the replication of many viruses, proteases that cleave viral polyproteins. There are inhibitors of these uh, specifically for HIV and hepatitis C virus. And finally, the release of viruses can even be targeted. The neuraminidase inhibitors of influenza virus target that specific protein and block virus release, as we'll see. Path of drug discovery is very long and very costly. Just to give you an idea, this is a rough sketch of all the steps you would have to go through from the beginning when you identify a medical need. You say this virus causes a, a certain amount of morbidity and mortality and the availability of an antiviral drug is warranted all the way to having clinical tested. There are many, many steps at which antivirals can fail. You have to do a lot of molecular biology and cell biological research uh, to understand the target. You have to have a proof of principle. If you say we're going to inhibit a protease, for example, you have to show that a lethal mutation in the protease prevents the virus from replicating. If, you, if the gene is redundant, then it would be useless, of course, to pursue uh, an inhibitor. Very often, structural studies are done on the target to elucidate what might be good approaches to designing inhibitors. Uh, and then at some point you can go to libraries of chemicals and natural products, compound collections that have been amassed, uh, combinatorial chemistry to make different sorts of, of classes of inhibitors, and carry out uh, both mechanism and high throughput screens to figure out which ones will inhibit your target. You then develop HITs, which are further modified to lead compounds. Uh, these are, again, tested in many ways. Besides cell culture, you move to uh, animals, you do pharmacology, toxicology, metabolism, and pharmacokinetics. Uh, 
things such as Will the compound get to the right place in the body at the right concentration? That's bioavailability. Will the compound persist in the body long enough to be effective? Pharmacokinetics. And will the compound be safe? Toxicity and specificity. And at some point you develop a drug candidate. You have to test it in animal models, not only for these questions and make sure that they're addressed by proper chemistry, um, but make sure there are no side effects. And of course, make sure it has the intended effect on virus replication and only after all that is done can you move into humans to so-called clinical testing which involves even greater costs. There are many hurdles to finding antiviral drugs. It's schematized in this interesting picture starting out with hundreds of thousands of compounds that are either synthesized or purified or acquired in collections only a few will have antiviral effects. So immediately after testing antiviral, you reject a number of them. Uh, you reject even more because they're toxic in cells. Uh, some of them may have antiviral effects in animals, but again, a number of those are rejected for toxicity. Uh, and then usually you move into human trials with one after all of these representative compounds have been through this process. Uh, and it may have acceptable toxicity, and it may have the intended inhibition of viral replication, after which point it can be moved to the, through the clinical trial process and approved for use. And this, whole, this whole process can take up to five or ten years, and it's not unusual for this uh, whole process to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So now you understand why we have so few antiviral drugs. They're simply not easy to develop. They're very costly. For example, the newest antivirals against hepatitis C virus, which were just put on the market within the last few years, uh, for a single dose costs upwards of $1,000. And the annual treatment is $150,000 per patient. And this, of course, reflects the enormous costs of developing these drugs. I want to tell you about a couple of ways that you can use modern screens to identify antiviral drugs. Here is what we call a mechanism-based screen. So we're looking for an inhibitor of a protease. And so what has been designed is a substrate that will facilitate the screening of many compounds to look for an inhibitor. And the first point here is that we know the cleavage site for the protease so that we can synthesize a substrate which is shown here, A, B, C, D, with the cleavage site between B and C. This substrate is coupled to a bead, so it can be physically removed from the solution. And then at the other end is a fluorescent tag. When this is cleaved by the protease, the part that emits green light in this case will, be, will remain in the soluble fraction, and the remainder can be uh, removed by centrifuging the bead. Now you can see right away that if the protease doesn't work or it's inhibited, that the bead will be still linked to the light emitting source. And therefore, when you centrifuge uh, this, if there's no uh, inhibition, the supernatant um, will contain very little fluorescent activity. So here's an example of this assay in practice. This is fluorescent intensity of the soluble peptide. So we're looking for the soluble peptide. Again, we're removing the beads by centrifugation. And you can see with time, you have an uh, increase in the, the amount of soluble peptide produced. So that is reflecting the cleavage of this compound by the protease. And you could then use this to screen many, many compounds for inhibiting uh, this release of the soluble fluorescent label. Here's a cell-based screen, which depends on a protein in the bacterial membrane that confers tetracycline resistance. So this is a tetracycline efflux protein. Uh, it makes bacteria resistant to tetracycline uh, because it pumps the drug out of the cell as soon as it gets in. This particular efflux protein has been engineered to have an HIV protease cleavage site on, on one of these loops inside of the cell. So if this molecule is cleaved by the HIV protease, which in this case is expressed inside of the bacteria, this will make the cells sensitive to tetracycline. So cleavage uh, 
destroys the function of the pump, makes the cells te tetracycline sensitive. So you can have a very simple assay of either tetracycline resistance or sensitivity to show whether the protease is working. And of course, you can use this to screen inhibitors simply by asking if uh, they result in tetracycline resistance bacteria. So resistance would be an inhibitor that inhibits the activity of the protease. So today, antiviral screening is done in what we call a high-throughput fashion. You screen many, many compounds for whatever your assay is, up to 10,000 or more compounds a day are feasible. We, have, we use chemical libraries, which can often be purchased depending on what target is being investigated. Uh, some, some companies also continue to screen natural products collections for antivirals. We use combinatorial chemistry, where chemists can use building blocks to build very large libraries of inhibitors for testing. Another important aspect is using structure-based design and in silico screening. For example, if you have the structure, the three-dimensional structure of a protein, say an enzyme that you're interested in, you can look at the structure of the active site and use computer modeling to sort through tens of thousands of inhibitors by saying, well, these don't bind to the active site at all, so they're not worth testing uh, in our and our chemical activities. And many uh, antivirals recently discovered have been tested in silico in this manner. High throughput screening involves using plates with many, many small wells in them, such as this one, and they're typically handled by robots, which can dispense material into the wells to do the assays, to do the protease assays, for example, and each well would have a different chemical compound in it. Uh, the robots assemble the mixtures, incubate them, uh, and then read the results and, and pass them on for analysis. Now, a, a big problem with antiviral drug development and use is resistance. Almost every antiviral uh, that we use today, viruses have evolved to become resistant to them. Um, and this is because viruses replicate efficiency, efficiently and they have modest to high mutation frequencies. This is a particular problem where a virus causes a persistent or a chronic infection and you have to treat for long periods of time. So if you have virus replication for long periods in the presence of an inhibitor, you can be assured that resistance to the antiviral drug will emerge. As I said, we have resistance to every drug in our arsenal so far. And this is a problem because the arsenal isn't big. This has been somewhat taken care of in the case of HIV-1, as we'll see later. But not this doesn't apply to other viruses. So what's the problem of drug resistance? Well, of course, if you're treating a patient with a particular drug, and viruses evolve to be resistant. You can't continue to use it because it's of no use. So you have to use another drug. And of course, in many cases, there, aren't, there isn't another drug available, in which case you can't do anything about the infection. It can be lethal. On the positive side, when we study resistance, particularly its genetic basis, uh, we get insights into the antiviral mechanism, and that can sometimes help us to design better inhibitors. Now, RNA viruses, as you know, as we've talked about before, have error-prone RNA polymerases without correction mechanisms. All polymerases are error-prone, but the DNA polymerases have error correction procedures. The RNA polymerases do not. Therefore, they make a lot of errors, and that's the basis of drug resistance. RNA viruses make one misincorporation for every 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides that are polymerized. And that's about a million times higher than the error rate of host DNA genomes. So our DNA polymerase makes a mistake in every million bases polymerized. So this frequency of mutation, 10, 1 in 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 nucleotides, means that in a 10 kilobase RNA virus genome, you would, you would expect uh, one mutation per 1 to 10 genomes. So again, at minimum, for a 10 kb genome, you would have one mutation. So that's very very high mutation rate because you're making tens of thousands of genomes per infected cell. So at random, eventually, you're going to have one that leads to drug resistance. 
In contrast, DNA viruses, as I've said, can replace misincorporated nucleotides. They have error correction procedures. As a consequence, DNA viruses evolve much more slowly than RNA viruses and occupy fewer niches. So here's an example of this in a, in a DNA. This is a double-stranded DNA, one strand of which is being copied by DNA polymerase. And here a mistake has been made by the polymerase. It's a mismatch. The enzyme is associated with a, a, an exonuclease, which can chew back this misreplaced or this mismatched base. And then the DNA polymerase goes back and fixes it. So that's one of the DNA repair mechanisms available to DNA viruses. There are others as well. But the point is that the DNA mutation rate is much, much lower than RNA. DNA viruses do evolve to drug resistance, but at much lower frequencies than RNA viruses. Let's talk about some of the antiviral compounds that are available today. And one of them is acyclovir, which is a very effective drug for herpes simplex virus infections. And this is a nucleoside or nucleotide analog, which is a very common class of antiviral drugs. So we'll use this as an example to illustrate uh, the, the inhibitors of many other viruses as well. As you know, nucleic acids are made up of four bases, adenine, guanine, thymidine, and cytidine. And these are the structures here. They all consist of a ribose, which is linked to one of the four different bases. And as you can see in this picture, the yellow highlights the core four uh, nucleosides. These are not phosphorylated as shown here. And derivatives of each of these have been made that are antiviral drugs. So if, for example, ribavirin and pencyclovir are both derivatives of guanosine. And for each, you can see a number of derivatives have been made. The derivatives are the antiviral compounds that block virus replication. Now, acyclovir is a derivative of guanosine. You can see that it lacks the lower part uh, of the ribose. And in particular, it doesn't have the hydroxyl to which new bases are added during DNA synthesis. And we'll see how that makes this an inhibitor uh, in a moment. Now, acyclovir in particular is a prodrug, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Here's how acyclovir inhibits herpes simplex virus infections. Here at the left is the drug ACV. This drug can enter cells where it is then phosphorylated by an enzyme called thymidine kinase, or TK, which is a virus-specific enzyme. It's only produced in cells infected by herpes simplex viruses. So this drug will not be phosphorylated in uninfected cells. That gives it a very low toxicity because it's not, if it's not phosphorylated, it's not going to inhibit DNA synthesis. Once it has one phosphate on the drug, again, put there by the thymidine kinase of HSV1, the drug can then be phosphorylated by two kinases that are from the cell. GMP kinase puts the second phosphate on, and then NDP kinase puts the third phosphate on. It's now available to be used by the viral DNA polymerase as it's copying viral DNA. And in fact, that's what happens as the virus uh, DNA polymerase here, as you can see, is copying this uh, lower strand. It, it inserts a molecule of ACV triphosphate, acyclovir triphosphate, into the growing chain. At that point, DNA synthesis stops because no additional nucleotides can be added because acyclovir cannot be added to. It doesn't have a 3' prime hydroxyl, which is essential for all DNA polymerization. The next base is added to the 3' prime hydroxyl. If you go back to the lectures on DNA and RNA synthesis, you'll see that was one of the essential features of nucleic acid synthesis, having a 3' prime hydroxyl present on which to add nucleotides. That can't be done with acyclovir, hence DNA synthesis stops. That's why this class of compounds uh, is called chain terminators. Now you may wonder why we have to go through this complicated phosphorylation mechanism in order to get this to work, and why not just give cells 
acyclovir triphosphate. Well, that will not get into cells because the three phosphates prevent this compound from getting across the cell membrane. So only the unphosphorylated form will get in. But fortunately, this compound is recognized uh, just by the viral thymidine kinase. Again, that makes it specific uh, for infected cells. Just as a side to show you how chemistry can be used to improve drugs, uh, the drug that is used today when it's necessary to treat herpes infections uh, orally is called valacyclovir, which is an ester derivative of acyclovir. So acyclovir is shown on the right. It was found by chemists that the addition of a valine, shown here, to this oxygen M, acyclovir, uh, markedly improves the bioavailability of this compound. In other words, when given orally, it gets to where it needs to go to prevent infections. And this is a, a prodrug also. When taken up uh, orally, uh, the, the valine is actually cleaved off by cellular enzymes, giving rise to a cyclovir, which can then be taken up into uh, infected cells. Now, acyclovir is often used topically for herpes simplex uh, virus infections. So the cold sores that arise periodically with herpes simplex virus reactivation. We talked about that during our persistence lecture. These can be treated by topical acyclovir as part of a cream. It's very effective at uh, reducing the duration uh, of the fever sore. You may remember that in very rare cases, one out of 200,000 infections, the virus finds itself in the central nervous system where it can cause herpes simplex uh, encephalitis. And in those cases, the drug uh, has to be uh, administered intravenously, uh, not as a cream, of course. Resistance to acyclovir also arises in herpes simplex virus infections, particularly when the drug is administered for long periods of time, uh, for example, for encephalitis. These are, again, they arise spontaneously. The DNA polymerase does make errors, even though they're much rarer than those made by RNA viruses. There are two classes of acyclovir resistant mutants. Some cannot phosphorylate the prodrug, and these mutations are in the viral thymidine kinase gene. So a single amino acid change in the TK gene makes it unable to recognize acyclovir and it can't be phosphorylated. Therefore, it can't terminate uh, chain growth and it doesn't inhibit viral replication. Another class of mutants can't incorporate phosphorylated acyclovir into the growing DNA chain. So those mutants, they are able to phosphorylate acyclovir, but it's not inserted into the chain. Those mutations, as you might guess, are in the viral DNA polymerase gene. They prevent the polymerase from uh, recognizing phosphorylated acyclovir. These uh, mutants resistant to acyclovir are a real problem, particularly in AIDS patient, patients who, as you know, are immunosuppressed and often acquire other viral infections. So TK resistant mutants, this slide should be TK resistant mutants, not simply TK mutants. They're devastating uh, because um, the mutants that lead to resistance in the TK gene are a real problem in AIDS patients because these can cause disseminated disease. They're often resistant to other nucleoside analogs uh, that require the thymidine kinase gene. In other words, if the, if the virus becomes resistant to acyclovir, it also becomes resistant to some other analogs that might be available. There are some other options which have different targets. Uh, and one of them is called foscarnet, which is a DNA polymerase inhibitor it does have more substantial side effects. Uh, mutations that lead to resistance that are in the DNA polymerase gene can also be resistant to foscarnet, in which case there are no treatment options left, and this is a, a real problem for these patients. Let's talk about the mechanism of action of Symmetrel or amantadine, which was one of the earliest inhibitors discovered. It's used to treat influenza virus infections. It interacts with the viral M2 protein, the ion channel. If you remember our talk about virus entry into cells, the virus binds to its receptor. It's taken up into an endosome. As the endosome acidifies, which will end up allowing the HA 
to catalyze fusion of the viral and endosome membranes. The protons are, in addition, pumped into the interior of the virion, or actually, I should say, pass into the interior of the virion because the M2 is a channel, not a pump. The acidification of the virion interior is essential for the ability of the viral ribonucleoprotein to be released from the viral membrane and enter the nucleus. So amantadine blocks this ion channel that allows protons to flow into the interior of the virion, and that blocks uncoding. So when you treat infections with amantadine, the virus can bind receptor, it can be taken into the cell, it can be endocytosed, the virion will fuse with the endosome membrane, but the RNAs will remain attached to the outer surface of the endosome, and infection will stop there. So here's a schematic of amantadine binding to this M2 ion channel. This is the viral membrane, the lipid bilayer, and uh, amantadine is, is um, shown here binding into the M2 and blocking the flow of protons. We know exactly how amantadine interacts with the M2 protein and in fact these amino acids that are labeled here that interact directly with the drug are the sites where resistance emerges. So single amino acid changes at any of these positions lead to amantadine resistance. Many of the human influenza viruses that circulate today are resistant to amantadine probably because it's been used widely for many, many years, not only in humans, but in veterinary uh, practices in farm animals, for example, to prevent infections. So it's not a very therapeutic option. So lots of resistance against the amantadine. However, the drug did help us understand the function of the M2 ion channel during virus infection, the fact that it does help pass protons into the virus interior. And we also have fortunately available neuraminidase inhibitors that block influenza virus replication. And to, re to explain how they work, let's review the influenza virus replication cycle. The virus begins its infection by binding to a sialic acid containing receptor uh, on the cell that's mediated by the hemagglutinin protein. Uh, the virus replicates in the cell and then is released by a budding process. So towards the end of infection, new virion particles are produced by budding. These, of course, have hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins on their surface. Now these proteins would remain at the cell surface via new interactions between the HA and sialic acid were it not for the neuraminidase protein, which cleaves sialic acids from the areas where new virions are budding. So the neuraminidase, in fact, allows the virus particles to move away from the cell surface and not be locked there by virus receptor interactions. Many years ago, it was shown that inhibiting the activity of the neuraminidase protein allows the viruses to remain on the cell surface. It prevents their spread and inhibits infection. Now, the substrate for neuraminidase is sialic acid, the same substrate that the virus binds to. And on the right is the structure of the neuraminidase tetramer showing the sialic acid binding pocket. So when the structure of this complex was solved uh, over 15 years ago, it was used to design inhibitors of the enzyme. So inhibitors were designed that mimic sialic acid and would fit into the sialic acid binding pocket. We have two such neuraminidase inhibitors currently available. Uh, the one on the left is called zanamivir or relenza, and the one on the right is called oseltamivir or tamiflu. And these are both designed to mimic the natural ligand of neuraminidase, again, which is sialic acid. The idea here was to make them look as close as possible to sialic acid, which would therefore, in theory anyway, make it difficult for the enzyme to change to be resistant to the drug because then uh, the enzyme wouldn't be able to bind the natural ligand sialic acid and the resistant virus would not be viable. So here's a schematic of how these neuraminidase inhibitors work. Uh, we're showing 
Tamiflu and Relenza. Uh, again, neuraminidase is shown as the Y, the purple Y, on the virion binding sialic acid. So this is towards the ends of the infectious cycle when the neuraminidase function is to remove sialic acid so the virus particles can be released. Oseltamivir and zanamivir fit into the sialic acid binding pocket of neuraminidase so they inhibit neuraminidase activity and they don't allow viruses to spread away from the infected cell. Now as you can see by this diagram, zanamivir has a better fit into the sialic acid binding pocket. It actually resembles, more closely resembles how sialic acid fits in the pocket than does oseltamivir. And it's quite easy for the virus neuraminidase to change to prevent a, a oseltamivir binding that's shown on the right hand slide. In fact, single amino acids at these three positions can cause resistance to oseltamivir while still allowing the neuraminidase to bind its ligand sialic acid. In contrast, resistance to zanamivir is much less frequent, possibly because uh, of the fact that zanamivir is, is a closer structural mimic of sialic acid, but also likely because the, the drug is used much less than is Tamiflu. Tamiflu can be taken orally, whereas zanamivir has to be inhaled uh, and which can't be used in, in certain individuals. Now the CDC keeps track of influenza virus isolates every flu season and these are the results of and they and they not only want to identify what influenza viruses are circulating but they want to know if there are resistance to any of these uh, virus inhibitors. So these are newer minidase inhibitor resistance testing on samples collected since October of last year. So you can see influenza A H3N2 strains, 381 samples tested. None of them were resistant to Tamiflu and none of them uh, resistant to uh, Oseltamivir. Same for influenza B, uh, no resistance. But the 2009 H1N1 virus, which continues to circulate, uh, in 2013, 2014, you can see there's a lot of resistance to uh, oseltamivir, 1.2% uh, of the circulating viruses, but again, not to zanamivir. So over time, these numbers of, of resistant strains will build until uh, the, the antivirals can't be used anymore. For example, at the, at the moment, all H1N1 and H3N2 strains are resistant to amantadines so you can't use them uh, for treating infections. Now this, these drugs, in particular Tamiflu, have been in the news lately because it's, uh, there have been a number of claims that um, the drugs don't actually work as well as, as advertised by the manufacturer. And if you search for Tamiflu, you'll come up with uh, any number of stories that are discussing this and the problems that the manufacturer has had uh, with this issue. So it's a really interesting question whether or not they are effective or not. I think part of the problem is that uh, we, we don't often diagnose what virus is causing a respiratory infection. And so uh, the failure of a drug to work may simply reflect the a fact that the virus involved isn't influenza virus. Anyway, it's an interesting problem and if, you, if you'd like to learn fur further about it, I'll put some links in the reading material. I want to talk a, a little bit about inhibitors of picornaviruses to illustrate uh, a couple of points. One being that you can modify initial uh, compounds in a number of different ways to try and find inhibitors that are more effective. So the compound at the uh, upper left was discovered in screens of chemical collections to inhibit picornaviruses like poliovirus and rhinovirus. And these were discovered in screens looking for inhibitors of virus replication in cell culture. So you can see the structure of this molecule on the upper left. Uh, on, in the middle are, are different chemical modifications of this structure and the resulting uh, inhibitory concentration against rhinovirus here. 
So you can see that these have been chemically modified in a number of ways. The, the structure is actually flipped around in these middle tables compared to the original diagram. So this is this two uh, oxygen double bond regions here are actually on the left in these tables. But you can see these have been modified chemically in a number of ways. Some of the compounds as a result are inactive uh, and some of them have uh, uh, a bit higher activity or a bit lower activity. You can see the minimal inhibitory concentration ranges here. This is a typical procedure for finding uh, more effective compounds when the initial one isn't strong enough but does provide an interesting lead. Here's another way that the chemists have modified this compound. They have changed the length of the carbon um, number of carbons in between the phenolic ring and the rest of the molecule here going from n equals 3 to n equals 10 and you can see some are inactive, some have higher activity and some have uh, lower activity. These drugs actually never made it uh, to approval. They weren't uh, effective, sufficiently effective in changing the course of uh, rhinovirus infections and more importantly resistant mutants arose very readily uh, during treatment. So none of these have used but they have been extensively studied to figure out how they work. And many of these are called wind compounds because they were initially developed by a company called Sterling Winthrop and it was found that they actually bind in a pocket in the viral capsid shown here. Now the, the coronavirus capsid, as you remember, is an icosahedral structure. The receptor binds into a groove for around the five-fold axis of symmetry for the enteroviruses anyway, such as poliovirus and Coxsackie virus. And these compounds that I just discussed previously bind to a hydrophobic pocket just below the receptor binding site. And that pocket is, ex is expanded in the diagram at the lower left here. And here you can see one of these compounds binding in the pocket. It's an extended hydrophobic molecule that makes contacts with amino acids on either side of the pocket. When resistance emerges, again, these amino acids that interact with the drug change and the drug is no longer held in the pocket. Here on the right is a single subunit of the capsid consisting of one molecule each of the four capsid proteins, VP1 through 4, and you can see this long white chain uh, is where the drug would bind. Now in the untreated virus particle that is not treated with drug, the virus in this position contains a cellular lipid. It can be sphingosine or any number of other cellular lipids. And the presence of that lipid is essential for uncoating, as we discussed in the virus entry lecture. When the virus binds to its receptor, this molecule leaves giving the capsid flexibility to undergo the changes needed to eject the viral RNA. It was determined that when you add these wind compounds to the virions, they displace the lipid in the pocket and bind so tightly that they don't come out when the receptor attaches to the virion. So they lock the capsid into a conformation that can't release its RNA. So this provided a great deal of insight into the uncoding process Unfortunately, the drug wasn't clinically useful, but in this case, it was useful experimentally. Hepatitis C virus for years has been treated with interferon, which hasn't always been a very successful treatment regimen, and therefore, uh, many companies have worked to discover new antivirals for that virus. This is the polyprotein of the virus. And as you can see, there are a number of proteases that are involved in processing the viral protein. And in particular, NS, the NS3, NS4A serine protease of the virus has been the subject of a number of antiviral screens. And two new compounds have recently been licensed for treating hepatitis C virus uh, infections, bosepravir on the left, telaprevir on the right. And again, these bind into the active site of the molecule that's shown here. This is the catalytic triad uh, of the molecule and this is the, one of the compounds binding uh, into that site. So these have recently been released and as I said earlier they cost a lot of money and it's not clear if, if they will be able to eradicate infection because they won't be able to be used in many of the populations uh, because they simply can't be afforded. Another developing target for hepatitis C virus is the viral RNA itself. As we 
discussed earlier, the replication of hepatitis C virus RNA depends on a cellular microRNA called MIR-122. And this microRNA has to bind at two sites in the 5' non-coding region of the viral genome in order for the virus to replicate. This is a liver-specific microRNA. Its natural function is involved in cholesterol regulation, but it's required by the virus to replicate, and the fact that it is liver-specific probably explains why the virus is largely hepatotropic. A number of anti-MIR-122 molecules have been developed that block it, sequester it, and prevent it from facilitating virus replication. And these are called antagomeres. They're special uh, antisense to, as, with respect to MIR-122 antisense nucleotides that are chemically modified so they last a long time in the blood. They bind to MIR-122 and they prevent it from binding the viral RNA. So here's one of these compounds called Miravirsin. Again, sequesters MIR-122 by binding to it. Here's the actual drug below here and it prevents uh, the virus from replicating. And here's an experiment in humans uh, of this drug. These are individuals who were infected with hepatitis C virus previously, of course, and we're looking at the change in viral RNA from baseline, uh, starting with uh, five weekly injections of either placebo or two different concentrations of miravirsin. And you can see that uh, viral RNA loads didn't change in the placebo-treated group, but uh, after five injections, five weekly injections for four weeks, uh, the viral levels declined substantially uh, in the treatment groups up until uh, 18 weeks with no further treatment. So this drug is progressing in clinical trials and shows a lot of promise. The pipeline of antiviral research against hepatitis C virus is highly extensive. If you go to hcvdrugs.com, you can see pages and pages of companies working on a variety of drugs uh, in different phases of research. Some of them are in research, preclinical, or phase one, two, or three trial, and even some of them are, uh, have uh, applications uh, for uh, new drugs at the FDA. So a lot of activity because, as we discussed, a while ago, a lot of people are infected globally uh, with this virus. Let's turn now to HIV and talk about how antivirals uh, work against that virus. There are many targets for intervention in the virus replication cycle. There are inhibitors of cell attachment, fusion, and entry. There are inhibitors of reverse transcription. Remember, this is a retrovirus. It has an RNA genome that's copied into a double-stranded DNA by the viral enzyme reverse transcriptase. So this is an enzyme that doesn't exist in the cell and offers a, a unique target for intervention. The viral DNA, as we remember, goes into the nucleus. It integrates into the cellular genome. The enzyme that takes care of that integration is called integrase. There are also inhibitors of that enzyme. There are some uh, experimental inhibitors of transcription and post-transcriptional processing. And finally, we have in inhibitors of proteases, which are important for uh, virus maturation. So let's talk about how this has worked. The main problem with AIDS therapy, it, therapy is that the virus replicates or can replicate in an infected host for 10 years and more. And it replicates the very, very high titers in the infected individual. So drug treatment is particularly difficult because uh, resistance to antivirals readily occurs. The first antiviral for HIV was called azetodeoxythymidine, or AZT. And this was a drug initially discovered uh, in screens for anti tumor cell compounds. It turned out it was also uh, active against HIV. This, very much like acyclovir, is phosphorylated to the active form. However, this can be phosphorylated by cellular kinases, so it's, it's far less specific than is acyclovir. It acts as a chain terminator. So at the bottom is the mechanism of action. Here is AZT. So you can see instead of a hydroxyl Again, that key hydroxyl where bases have to be added during chain extension, there's an azido group, N3, 
So that will be a chain terminator. When this drug gets into the cells, it's phosphorylated uh, by three different kinase to the triphosphate, AZT triphosphate. It's then incorporated into DNA by reverse transcriptase and then acts as a chain terminator. It will be used by cellular polymerases, but not as well as the HIVRT. And so it does have toxicity, but it does inhibit virus replication. So unlike the acyclovir, it has substantial uh, side effects. It can be taken orally, but its half-life is one hour. Therefore, uh, patients have to be dosed multiple times a day. Uh, because of that and the severe side effects, it, it uh, often was discontinued by patients. And within a, a year of being used for HIV infections, uh, resistant mutants emerged. Uh, these had single amino acid changes at one of four sites in the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and that failed to recognize the phosphorylated AZT. So the basis for mutation is that the altered RT enzymes don't bind the phosphorylated compound. As soon as these uh, resistant mutants arose, new nucleoside analogs were developed. Some of them are shown here, didanosine or DDI, a derivative of inosine, uh, didioxycytidine, stavudidine, and lemuvidine, or 3DC. So all nucleoside analogs that get phosphorylated uh, and engage in chain termination. These were, since there were so many of these, this uh, led to the concept of combination therapy and two antivirals were used at a time to combat resistance. And while this worked initially, eventually within a year, mutants resistant to both drugs that were being utilized in the combination therapy arose. At the same time, uh, companies were identifying the so-called non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NNRTIs. So here's the structure of reverse transcriptase on the left. The active site of the polymerase in the palm of the enzyme. This is a, an enzyme much like all the other nucleic acid polymerases. It has an active site in the palm. It has a fingers and a thumb domain that make up the rest of the enzyme. Of course, the nucleoside inhibitors that we just talked about would bind in the active site because that's where nucleic acid polymerization occurs. The non-nucleoside inhibitors bind a short distance away to the polymerase. That's why we call them non-nucleoside inhibitors. They cause conformational changes in the active site, which then block incorporation of nucleosides. So these are screened specifically for the RT and have specificity for that uh, enzyme. Here on the right is the structure of one of them, the green molecule shown uh, binding into the reverse transcriptase molecule. And at the bottom are three examples of uh, non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. I, I can't pronounce any of these names because, and they're, I don't think you should worry about it because they're all made up anyway and impossible to pronounce. As you might guess though, resistance to the, even these compounds get selected very rapidly and that comprises amino acid substitution in any one of seven different amino acids that uh, line the binding site on the enzyme where the drug is binding. So let's go back to the previous slide. You can see here where this compound is binding in the RT. It interacts with specific amino acids. Mutations at any one of those will prevent the drug from binding and lead to resistance. So these cannot be used alone to treat AIDS. They're now used in combination therapy. None of these drugs can be used alone because you get resistance so quickly. They're also inhibitors of the protease. The protease is absolutely required for making infectious virus particles. To refresh your memory, the viruses are assembled at the sur cell surface by budding. The precursor of the structural proteins, the gag protein, is shown here. It's processed by the viral protease PR, which is the yellow sphere here, to, to give you matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid, etc., all the proteins that are needed to build the virion. The protease is also 
assembled into the virus particle and carries out the maturation of the particles once they have been budded from the cell. So it's absolutely required for the production of infectious virions. In the very early days, it was shown that mutations in the protease gene are lethal to virus replication, the proof of concept that you could target this enzyme with an antiviral. So early in the development of protease antivirals, a key finding was, the, was that first we figured out what the substrate for the protease was. And here at the top is a sequence of amino acids in one of the substrates of the HIV protease surrounding the cleavage site, which is shown in the red triangle. So normally the protease would cleave the viral protein here between this tyrosine and this proline. Early on, it was shown that short substrates, 10 to 20 amino acids in length, could be cleaved by the viral protease, allowing development of rapid screens for inhibitors. And at the bottom is one of the initial inhibitors of the protease that was developed. And you can see that part of it is a precise mimic of the actual cleavage site in the viral polyprotein. This area in yellow, shaded in yellow, is exactly the same on the substrate, the natural substrate of the HIV protease, and in the inhibitor, the chemical inhibitor. The, the compounds on the, the chemical groups on either side of this in the inhibitor are different, but the actual active part is the same. This is called a peptidomimetic. It mimics the peptide substrate of the protease. It binds in the protease active site and prevents it from cleaving the actual protein. We also have inhibitors of the integrase, and the integrase, you may remember, is a viral enzyme that is needed to integrate the viral DNA, which is produced by reverse transcription, into the cellular genome. And to remind you how that works, here's a schematic. The viral DNA is shown here. Uh, the integrase is shown as a sphere here with a donor and an acceptor site. The integrase binds both viral DNA and host DNA. And you remember it makes a nick in both strands of the host DNA and then ligates the viral DNA to it. The mechanism of action of integrase is very similar to that of DNA polymerases in that it is mediated by two metal ions that bind to key residues in the integrase. And that's shown at the bottom of this figure. Uh, here are the two metal ions binding uh, to the integrase, and that's needed in order for the integrase to carry out its function. The integrase inhibitors, one of them shown here, DKA, binds to the two metal ions, preventing the integrase from acting on the viral DNA. So it's a direct inhibitor of the integrase. Uh, this was licensed in October of 2007. And again, uh, resistance emerges very quickly, but when used in combination therapy, that can be managed. There's also an inhibitor of CCR5. CCR5 is one of two co-receptors needed uh, by the virus to bind to cells. You may remember that the virus binds to CD4 and one of two chemokine receptors, CCR5 or CXCR4. CCR5 is naturally absent in 4 to 16 percent of people of northern European descent. So people can live without a functional CCR5 protein. And in fact, an inhibitor of CCR5 has been developed that inhibits the function of the protein and blocks HIV binding. And that inhibitor is shown on the left, its chemical structure. Uh, it binds to CCR5. It's the yellow sphere in the membrane. Normally, when the virus binds to CD4, that then induces a, a binding site on CCR5. In the presence of, in, of the uh, inhibitor of CCR5, uh, the high affinity binding doesn't occur and virus infection is blocked. We also have inhibitors of fusion. Uh, fusion, you may remember, occurs when the viral glycoprotein binds its cellular receptor the fusion proteins then uh, insert their peptides into the uh, host cell membrane. This undergoes a hairpin reaction 
which brings the two membranes together, allowing fusion. A drug was developed, which is a short peptide. It's a 36 amino acid peptide shown here on the left. And this is the exact sequence uh, of one of these N-terminal regions of the glycoprotein that forms this triple helical bundle. Uh, the, the drug essentially binds to this region. It becomes another member of this triple helix, as shown here, and it prevents the hair pinning. So normally the, the, the glycoprotein bound to the receptor would undergo this hair pinning. In the presence of this peptide, the hair pinning is prevented, so fusion is prevented. So the peptide essentially block, binds to the glycoprotein, blocks the transition into the active fusion conformation. It's a very expensive drug. Uh, it has to be hydrated by the patient uh, each time and, and injected. So it does have some obstacles to, to its use. And again, resistance has been observed. Amino acid changes uh, in the peptide binding site on the transmembrane protein readily arise that prevent it from binding. We now know that we treat, the only way to treat HIV with antiviral drugs is by combination therapy. This is called heart or highly active antiretroviral therapy. We can now treat HIV as a chronic disease that goes on for a very long time with multiple drugs. And typically each of these target a different mechanism, and now we even have a single pill containing three inhibitors. Initially these were given as separate pills, and pills now containing three different inhibitors have been approved. So let's look at the mathematics of drug resistance to understand why this works. Let's assume that you need one mutation for drug resistance. The mutation rate for the virus is one mutation every 10,000 bases that are polymerized. What that means is that in 10th to the 4th viruses, 10,000 viruses, if you have a tube of 10,000 viruses, every base is substituted in those 10,000 viruses. An infected person makes 10 to the 10th new viruses every day. So if we take 10 to the 10th viruses per day and divide it by 10 to the 4, which is every base substituted in 10 to the 4 viruses, that means every person infected will make a million viruses each day with resistance to one drug. Okay, a million viruses a day, and that's why very quickly drug resistance uh, evolves in HIV-infected individuals because the mutation rate is high and the number of virions made each day is very high as well. Let's do two drugs. Developing resistance to two drugs, so the same number, 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 4 for each drug, you multiply those, when we use 2, you get 10 to the 8th. So again, we take 10 to the 10th virions made per day, we divide by 10 to the 8th, probability of getting resistance to two drugs. 100 viruses resistant to two drugs are going to be made each day in an HIV-infected individual. So 100 is much lower than a million, but still not enough to prevent resistance, and this is why we still see resistance to two drug therapy against HIV. How about three drugs? Well, you need 10 to the 12th viruses needed. And we're only making 10 to the 10th per day. So that is why triple therapy works. And remember, these are numbers assuming that virus replication is not suppressed at all by the drugs. And of course they are. So that's why it takes a little bit longer to get resistance to one drug uh, and to two. Now, this number, 10 to the 12, may seem insurmountable, but it's not. And drug resistance to triple therapy does arise, although it takes much longer. And when it happens, the combination of drugs can simply be changed. So here's a table which lists many of the drugs that have been approved for treatment of HIV infections. You can see there are over 30 of them. And there are different targets. they are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. They're the, the, the non-nucleoside inhibitors. We talked about both of them. Protease inhibitors, fusion, entry inhibitors, 
uh, integrase inhibitors. And then here is one of the triple uh, combination therapy pills called a tripla. So there are lots of drugs made by many different companies, and that's because, of course, uh, this is an infection that involves tens of millions of people globally uh, for which we have no vaccine and no vaccine in sight due to a number of, of difficulties that we'll talk about when we consider AIDS at the end of this course. So really, uh, antivirals have been the only recourse, and it, it's been gratifying that so many can be discovered. And you can see the approval dates of some of these, and some of them have had a very short time to approval, which is another aspect of the uh, AIDS pandemic, that with so many people uh, demanding help, the approval process has been accelerated. Now, a lot of the work leading to these compounds was possible because we had a long history of basic molecular virology research on retroviruses. We'd understood, for example, that there was a reverse transcriptase produced a virus-specific enzyme, and integrase produced that integrated the genome, and that proteases were needed to process the viral protein. Without that, it would have taken much, much longer to develop these inhibitors. So another one of my calls for the importance of basic research uh, to develop therapies that impact human health. And I'll leave you with this thought. Today, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on the planet. We can get that number by multiplying the number of infected people with the number of viral genomes that we know are present in each person. That is a big number. In fact, it's so big that it's probable within those 10 to the 16th genomes that there are genomes resistant to all 30 plus antiviral drugs that we have now and that we ever will develop. We already have resistance to anything that we will develop. So that's a sobering thought because it's such a big number. And I think that while drugs have really had a great impact on the disease, uh, we still need to find out other ways to uh, prevent HIV infection.